think I just have some job trouble. Okay, I don't need it. <laughs> it doesn't really matter because the uh, technology is just a tool. I think the most important thing is the Word of God. That's what I believe. The reason why I use PowerPoint is not because I, I don't believe the power of the Word because it's just for the sake of some people, they're having trouble flipping to the right pages of the Bible, maybe the first time in the church. Uh, they're not able to flip to the page of the, uh, the passage, so that's why I, all, I, I, have get you, I have gotten used to PowerPoint just to help people to follow through uh, the, uh, the, the, the message. Uh, I don't really need the PowerPoint because I believe that all of you are adults to mature and you really have a heart to long for the Word of God. So just follow through the passage and, and then the Spirit of God will speak to us. Uh, I would use the Abraham Lincoln as, a, as an opening uh, illustration. Abraham Lincoln, he was the 16th president of the United States. In March 1861, it was a while ago, and it was during Abraham Lincoln's time that he led the uh, America through the bloodiest civil war, and it was a time of crisis for the Americans. It was the moral crisis, a constitutional crisis, as well as a political crisis for the Americans. But in doing so, he he took on this task, he took on this crisis, and he persevered. Because of his perseverance, he preserved the Union. He abolished the slavery, and he strengthened the federal government, and he modernized the American economy. But unfortunately, in 1865, only four years after, April 1865, Lincoln was assassinated. So about four years later, he was assassinated. And at that time, the whole country, I would say whole country, but most of the people, most of the Americans, they, they just couldn't understand why such a great president such a great a Christian president was assassinated. And they said, why? He was leading the country towards a stronger America and better future, but why his life was cut off untimely? People were just asking their questions. I think in many ways, we ask the same questions. Why? When things are not going on right in our lives. Well, we just don't understand why certain things happen in our lives, and we have no, absolutely no clue. And, and these things, they don't make sense to us. And we just ask, why? Why wouldn't God let what happened before be, just became a dream, and then let's all start over again? And we, we would go back to the good old days, and everything would be fine. But we still don't get the answers why. You probably, uh, if you, if you uh, read the news, you know, you know, a civilian airplane was shot down. 298 people, 298 lives were lost. Is it because it was mistaken as a military plane? And 298 people, innocent lives, they were lost? A daughter, high killers, to kill her parents, to get the insurance money? Why? What's happening? Many... Even many infertile couples to try to conceive a child, and at the same time, many unwanted pregnancies, they find the, 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 the remedies in abortion clinics. Why? What's happening around us? We just don't understand. It seems like our world is in crisis. Not just in crisis, but in crises. Your life, my life, we, we, we come face to face with crisis every day. We just don't understand why. Somehow we just lost hope. We feel, why, why did God allow all these things happening in our lives? And sometimes we get so discouraged. Some people, they, they say, forget it. I'm not going to continue this journey, spiritual journey, because I don't see reasoning. I don't see justice in our lives, because somehow God allowed all these things happen in our lives. I remember one time I talked to a friend. He 
he didn't go to church. I said, would you like to come to church with me this time? He said, I don't want to. I said, why? And his, his, basically his answer is, I just could not see the reason why I should go to church because you see so many problems around us. If there's a God, if there's a good God, I just don't seem to understand this God. It's, he has control of all these things happening in our lives. If he, if he does have control, why would he allow these things happen in our lives? I suppose the answer still lies with God. We cannot find the reasons. We cannot find any reasonable or acceptable answers for our why questions. And I believe, when I read the Bible, I believe God does not create evil, nor he has evil plans in his mind. Evil is the consequence of sin. We may find it hard to understand, but in reality, we see evils. We see suffering in the world. But most of the evil and suffering were caused by sin, by the problems of other people. There's a book called Hurt People, Hurt People. Have you, heard about, have you ever heard a book called Hurt People? Hurt People. If you are hurt, you hurt people. That I have seen these days, you know, when I do the counseling, marital counseling, when I do the uh, uh, other types of counseling, I realize that many people, they, when they get hurt, and they go out and hurt others. And they, yet they complain, why did this thing happen to me? Why in the first place that I have these unfortunate happenings? And yet they go out and hurt others. I feel very sad these days, you know, when people don't understand uh, some of the evils and sufferings actually are the result of a sinful human nature. And we have, we have the boldness to say, why me? Why I have to suffer? Yet we cause sufferings on other people. Yet in the midst of evils and suffering, crisis, we still want to find out the answer, why? As I said before, the answer lies with God. Only God can tell us why. Perhaps that, you know, our understanding is limited. Perhaps our, our worldview is limited by our by our cultural setback, by our cultural confinement. We just don't see beyond our culture telling us what life is all about. Somehow, I believe that in all this crisis, all this evils and suffering, God does have, God does have a plan. Whether you can catch on to that plan or not, it is really up to you. Because God's plan is pretty obvious. He lays out his plan, detailed plan, in the Bible. And God does have a plan for you and for me today. If you go back to uh, the passage we read earlier, Joshua chapter 1. I, I, I preach on Joshua many times, but every time when I preach on Joshua, I have a different message. I have a different message than the last one that I preach. So this one actually is a new message that I, uh, I came up with. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, the first part, it said, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, Imagine that you were Joshua. You were the Joshua. You were the successor. And then, and, and, then, and then you were supposed to take on Moses' role, leading the Israelites you know, uh, for the next step. But then you ask the same question. Wasn't Moses the greatest lead, leader ever happened to the Jewish people, the Israelites? Wasn't he the greatest? Yes, he was the greatest leader. But he was the first leader anyway. But he was the greatest because he was recognized as a man of God. And can you imagine? Joshua would ask this question, why me? God, could you not let Moses die? Wouldn't Moses be the most appropriate person to lead the Israelites to go into the land of Canaan? He said he was the best person, best leader. Why wouldn't you want me to do it? If he were to lead the Israelites out of the, out of, uh, across the, the, the Jordan River, I think it would be best. I, if I were Joshua, I would ask God these questions. God, why me? Why, would you, why wouldn't you let Moses live and allow him to lead the Israelites to cross the Jordan River to the west side and claim the land? Besides, I think Joshua saw what God had done through the hands of Moses. Moses worked numerous miracles and signs of wonder and, and remember the ten plagues. Remember, you know, how, how, how he just hit the rock and water came out from the rock. 
signs and wonder, miracles were the, uh, the uh, you can say the, the trademark of Moses. So if, if God used Moses and lead Moses cross the Jordan River and, and defeat the Canaanites, well, that would be the best. I would say that was the best. But somehow God had a different plan than you and I had in mind. Somehow God's plan is different. We, our plan was Moses was the best person. Moses was the best leader to lead the Israelites to cross the Jordan River and claim the land. But somehow God said, no, I wanted you. I want you, Joshua, to do it. In Isaiah chapter 58, 55, eight verses 8 to 9, that explains very well. It said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In the book of Isaiah, basically God revealed that he has a better plan than your plan, than my plan. Many times we seek our plan. We scratch our head, we pray, we do everything we can just to have our plan set in place. Many times we're seeking our own plan and thinking that that is the best plan for us, but not knowing that God has a different plan. That's why when our plan is not fulfilled, not realized, and then we complain. And we wondered, God, where are you? Are you listening? What happened to my prayers? What happened to the prayers of my fellow brothers and sisters? They pray for me, and you don't listen to my prayer, or you don't listen to our prayers as well. But somehow, if you go back to Isaiah 55, the God's reminder, say, hey, my ways are higher than yours. My ways are better than yours. Don't think that your plan is the best plan. I have a better plan for you. And Jeremiah also reminds us that just God said, my plan is to prosper you. It's not to hurt you, not to harm you. Somehow, when we, we read through the Bible, we need to be reminded, if God has a plan, that plan must be the best. Whether we like it or not, his plan is the best. Only if we have eyes to see, only if we have the nerve to feel the power of God's plan, only in hindsight we look back and say, yes, God's plan is the best. I think for those of us who are uh, married, I know there's some guys that talk to some guys, they say, oh, I wish I would not marry. <laughs> I wish I could have another one. I talked to actually I talked to men. They express that kind of feelings. I wish maybe someone else. I said, come on guys, think carefully. There's no one better than the one that you have had. There's no one better than you know the one that you married to. Yes, that person has weaknesses. Yes, that person has problems. So are you. You have problems. You're not perfect. If you're not perfect, why would if you're perfect? Okay, if you're perfect. Why would your wife or your spouse marry you? That your wife probably just, uh, if you're perfect, okay, so I'll put it that way. Where I'm saying that if your wife is perfect, if your spouse is perfect, why would your spouse would marry you? If, if, your, if your spouse marrying you, that makes your spouse imperfect because you're not perfect. I'm just turning on the radio. So what I'm saying that for those of us who are married, let's just be reminded the spouse is prepared by our Lord. His plan is the best plan. You may not be content. You may have some fantasies. But let me tell you, if that's the plan God has for you, that's the best. And treasure and cherry what you have today. Because that's the plan that God has for us. And somehow we don't agree. But in hindsight, give us a few more years. And you know, and who's the person who, will be, who stay uh, next to you to take care of you when you have problems, when you're sick? Your spouse. I was telling one couple uh, recently, uh, the husband and the, and, the, and the wife is just having some big conflict. And I was telling the, the, the husband, I, was, I told him, I said, plainly, I said, you have so much complaint about your wife. But when you're sick, who stay close to you, who prepare all this medicine for you, who take care of you, your wife. Yes, you have some verbal you know, conflicts, that's fine. But the one who really cares to the end, to the end who really st stay by you to the end, is your spouse. It's not your mother. 
is not your friend. The one who stays with you and for you to the end is your spouse. So when you, but those who are not married, if you're looking for a spouse, you pray to God that God's plan be realized in your life, and then you will not regret because that the person, that's the person who stay by you, stay with you to the very end. That's the intention of God for us. That's the plan of God for us. So for Joshua, he could not understand why wouldn't, why did Moses die? He's really 120 years old. Come on, I mean Abraham. Adam lived so, so many hundred years, okay? Why is Abraham, uh, Moses was only 120 years old. Uh, give him 20 more years so that he, he could you know, help Israel to conquer the land of Canaan. But that's not what God had in mind. And God, as a matter of fact, had always preparing Joshua to be the successor. In other words, God has always preparing you and me to take on the challenges, even though we don't know it. God has been preparing you and me for something greater in our lives. And when those crises come, and then we say, hey, why me? But don't you realize, God has been preparing you for such a time like this. Joshua is a great example for us to learn. God tested Joshua's bravery in Numbers chapter 13, verse 1 to 3 and 8. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites for each ancestral tribe. Send one of his leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. And then verse 8, he said, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun, was chosen as the tribal leader to be one of the 12 spies to spy out Canaan. In order to be qualified to be a spy, you have to be brave, right? You, you were asked to go to a land that you were never gone before. You had to be brave. You have to be smart. You had to be sensitive. And you had to say yes to the challenge. Somehow, I think all of us who have been in the church for a while, many of, many of us have been around for 20 years, so I see some of the old faces been around for 20 years. Some of you have been around for maybe a few months, maybe a few years. But do you realize God has prepared you for challenges in ministries and life? God has challenged, God has been preparing you all these years that there's a, ti- a time will come that God wants you to show your spiritual muscle. It's time to serve. I, I understand that the nomination just started, you know, the, for 2015. 2015 uh, for the EB uh, executive board. Somehow God made his move upon someone's heart. I know that some of you have been duck. The Spirit of God tugging you and say, hey, hey, perhaps it's time for you to come out to serve God. Perhaps it's time for you to be involved in the church in a different way. Perhaps it's time for you to, yes, to show that you want to get involved in the Father's business. So God has been preparing Joshua. Probably he, he didn't think much about it. God allowed him to be chosen, and he was willing to respond to that call to be a spy. And when he was chosen as a spy, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 16b, and Moses actually changed Hoshea's name. In 16b, he said, Moses gave Hoshea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. What? The significance of it. What's the, what's the point of it? Why, why, Moses, why are you changing his name? The name Hoshea is, basically means salvation. Salvation. You have salvation. But then the word, the name Joshua, it means Jehoshia, meaning that may God save you. So when Joshua was about to go into the land of Canaan to be a spy, Moses basically, basically gave him a blessing. May God protect you. May God save you. This is a dangerous mission. You are going into the land of the unknown. You've never been there before. May God save you. And Joshua took on the task. Yes, God saves me. Somehow today, whatever crisis you are, you find yourself in, I believe God will save you because you've been saved by Jesus Christ. And whatever challenges, struggles that you find yourself in, whether it's personal conflicts, whether it is just your 
big things are happening at work, families. Uh, these days I find a lot of conflicts happening within the families, and I feel so sad to deal with these conflicts. And I understand that you know, when people don't listen to the word of God, it doesn't matter you have the best counselor in the whole world. It won't work. It won't cut out because people still resume to their own mindset of revenge, of having my own plan, but not taking on the plan of God in our lives. So God has been preparing Joshua, and God in the same fashion, God has been preparing you for the time of crisis or for a time of need. So God prepared Joshua for bravery, for his courage, and God also prepared Joshua for his faith. You know, when, they, when the uh, spies came back for the report of what, ha- what they saw in the land of Canaan, this is uh, what, what he said in Numbers chapter 13, verses 32 to 33. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report. They meaning the 10 spies out of the 12. Okay, there are 12 spies. Uh, 10 spies, they spread bad report. Only two spies, they didn't. That's Joshua and Caleb. About the land they had explored, they said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there, there are of great size, the giants. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. Pretty scary report, isn't it? We, imagine that I, I go to the NBA and play, play, play ball in the NBA, you know, man. These are the giants, right? Say, whoa, my goodness. I have to just look up. The chance for me to win is just zero. Right? If I go play ball with the, with the NBA team, the chances for me to win is basically zero. This is the same report that the town spy told the Israelite community. And then in 14, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 9, this is what Joshua, he gave a different report. He said, only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone. But the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. I find it very interesting. As a situation that we're one supposed to be scared, to be afraid, but because he understood. This is the plan of the Lord. God has a plan for the Israelite community. We shall not be afraid. Today, if you believe God has a plan for you and for this community, for this faith community, and we shall not be afraid. Whatever crisis we are going through, if God is behind it, if God allows certain things happen, do not be afraid. Stay put and to see and to observe the hands of the Lord guiding us through. I believe God enables us to go through, to walk through this crisis. Whatever crisis you have, maybe the church, maybe your own personal life, I believe that the most important thing is you have to be sure that this is the plan of God. And I recognize that this is the plan of God for me to walk through this crisis, the plan of God for the church to go through this crisis, and the plan of God for me to take on this crisis, not with my own strength, but with the wisdom and with the teaching of the Lord of Jesus Christ. God has been molding Joshua to become a great leader, and I believe God has been molding you and me to be a significant believer in the community to do the work of God. This is the family of God. This is the church. When I look at the church, this is not the four walls of the building. When I look at the church, the people is the church. You are the church. I am the church. We are the church. And when God has given us this plan of the church, that God has a plan for you and for me. All these crises, all these challenges, problems that we have encountered in our lives are preparing us for this, the battle. And I think that we can win the battle. And God has prepared Joshua. Bravery, faith, God has prepared you. As you study the word of God, God will strengthen your faith. God will give you the courage to move on, not to stop, not to return, go, go back. Just like some of the Israelites at that time, they wanted to go back to Egypt. They would rather be slaves than free people. Today, Lord Jesus Christ has given us freedom. 
Lord Jesus Christ has given us a new life. And Lord Jesus Christ has given us this church. We are not letting Jesus Christ down in a way. Because we are going to expand, uh, not the church, the, the building. We are going to expand the ministry. We are going to spread the gospel, preach the gospel to people to bring the people to Christ. May not be necessary to this church, but we bring people to Christ. So this is the business of the Father. This is the Father's business, and we are called to do that challenge, to take on that business. And God has prepared Joshua for that, for the Father's business. That is to lead the Israelites to cross the Jordan River and go to the West Bank and claim the land. But at the same time, God understood how Joshua felt. Joshua felt depressed. And God, Joshua felt afraid. Can you understand why Joshua felt afraid, nervous? I think some of us would say, hey, Joshua, you had a great opportunity. There's a great opportunity waiting for you. Hey, you, you become the, the leader of the whole Israelite community. Isn't this good news? You should be happy. You should be great. You should celebrate. Why are you moping around? Why are you so sad? Why do you look so afraid? You become the leader. Why are you so afraid? But during that time, God had a pleading. God spoke to Joshua. But God has a plan. Joshua didn't understand. Somehow, not only he didn't understand, but he was afraid. He was just like, oh, can I not do it? Have you have a a situation that, you know, it happened to me before. They say, can I not do it? Can I not do it? Can someone else do it? I think it happened to me before. I said, can I not do it? And I'm just afraid. But at that time, God spoke to Joshua. Think about it. God, the creator, he actually spoke to Joshua. He's supposed to be a leader. He's supposed to be a military leader. And God spoke to him because he was afraid. Because he, wasn't, he was uncertain about his future. And God said, Joshua, come on. In, in the chapter uh, one, one, 1, 1b and 2, it said, The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. When I, when, I read, when, I had, when I read these two verses, I just couldn't help to playing the paraphrasing in my, in my own hand. I, I kind of get the impression that God told Joshua, come on, guy, get ready, get up. Stop moping around. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop reminiscing the good old days about when Moses was around. You following Moses? Stop playing the second fiddle, you know, mentality. Moses is not, not around anymore. You are the leader now. You are the leader, and you should take up your responsibility. The time is now, not tomorrow, not next month. The time is now. Take up your responsibility. Take up your calling and be a leader. Respond to it. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. And take the people and go to the west side of Jordan. This is your life. Oh, boy, I think that's a very powerful word, even though it's like two verses. I, I, I felt you know, God was speaking to me personally. Stop complaining. Get up. Clean your own ass. Get people together and do the work of God. This is where, why you were called in the first place. Somehow, I think as the people of God, we so focus on the problems. We so focus on the, the bad things. Not knowing that God has a greater and better plan for us. What is the plan of God for us? Is it just build a bigger building? No. I don't think so. God's plan is about the souls of people. God cares about the lost people. I think we focus, if we focus, if we set our focus right, our focus should be outside. Our focus should not be inside. If we spend so much energy in making ourselves feel good, we, this is not the plan of God. God doesn't want us to feel good about ourselves, about our our, our happy get-together meetings. God cares about souls, people, lives, being changed, transformed. Yet we spend so much time about you know, personal conflicts, about these matters, but this is not important. 
The most important thing is about people's lives. Have we done that? Have we changed people's lives these days? And yet we spend so much energy, consume our time in just all these personal things, and yet we think we're doing the right thing. Even our own personal lives, our families, our, sp our spouse, our children, our work. We spend so much time, we are consumed by all these things without knowing that God's mandate is not about this. If we are truly authentic followers of Jesus Christ, then we know what to do. We live for God. We don't live for our passion. We don't live for our marriage. We don't live for our work. We don't live for our children. We live for God. What is that? The gospel, the mission, the biblical mandate for the church. So when God saw Joshua moping around, he said, oh, oh, I'm so bad. I feel so bad. I don't want to do it. Have you ever been in that state? I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I, I, absolutely, I've been in those times before. I said, I, didn't want to, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. But without knowing that the purpose and the plan of God in my life, I would say, I don't want to do it. But when I discovered God has a plan in my life, then my attitude changed. I said, I don't care about all these things. These things are good, but not the most important thing. The most important thing is I'm going to hold on to God. He has a plan for me, and I have to keep on doing that. That is the mission that God has for me. All this crisis, whether it's in the church, whether it's in my own life, whether it is in my work, it will be done. It will be resolved if I am serious in following God. He will enable me to resolve all these issues. But I will not let those issues consume all my time. Can you imagine the mighty hand of God? Can you imagine God spoke to Joshua in such a way? Come on, Joshua. Cheer up. Come on. Get up. Do it now. Don't not tomorrow. Today. Get up. Serve me. Serve the community. Bring them across the Jordan River to the land that I have promised to the ancestors. I don't know what kind of situation that you find yourself in. It could be very difficult. But I, let me assure you, God understands. Whatever crisis, difficult situation you find yourself in, whatever conflict you find yourself in, God understands. God will provide a way out for you. But you have to be sure that you follow God. Not following your own will, your own plan. But if you follow God, God will resolve all these things for you. Every time when I hit rock bottom, God speaks to me through such a Bible. <laughs> in this is the Bible. It's holy word. God speaks. He spoke to Joshua. But today, I want to assure the young and the, uh, young, uh, the, the, the younger ones, the young adults, the older ones, God spoke. He speaks. He will speak again tomorrow because he has given us his word. That's I find comfort and I find faith because God has spoken. He will not stop speaking to us because we have the word of God. And I believe that. The problem is we don't read. We ignore the word of God. Our heart's not, our heart's not responding to the word of God. Or that's why we find ourselves so much, you know, entangled in our emotions, in our confusion, in our rejection as well. So when we're responding to the word of God, when God's, when God finally spoken to us, we respond, our crisis will see a different light in a crisis. No wonder King David calls God, uh, truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and I will never be shaken. Joshua was shaken pretty bad. He was scared. He didn't know where to turn. He didn't want to be the leader. But yet God said, get up. Do it now, not tomorrow. Come on, get up. The same way God speaks to you and me today. If you found in crisis, if your church is in crisis, get up. Now is the time. Follow me. He will take care of it. If church has a problem, you think you can resolve it? No. God will take care of it. It's not for you, for me, to resolve it. God will take care of it. But you and I, we're just simply following God. He will take care of it. Remember Peter asked uh, Jesus, what happened to John? 
Jesus said, "What is that? What is your business? What does that What does that have to do with you? What happened to John is none of your business. You just follow me." I think today we take the same attitude. Whatever struggle problems that come our way, come our way, our business is to follow Jesus Christ closely. Let us not lose sight. Who is our Lord? Who is our true leader? Let us not resume to our own emotions and our own understanding, own method to resolve issues. Follow God. Do what He asks us to do. And then finally, God has a promise, an assurance for Joshua. In verses three to five, He said, "I'll give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses." Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God gave Joshua a certificate. You know what a certificate is? You take the certificate. That guarantees you something, right? It guarantees you you have this qualification. Let's say if you uh, graduate with a diploma, that the certificate that guarantees other people, you as well, that you have completed the requirements of that academic program. I also thought about you know a wedding, you know the Chinese weddings, uh, the Chinese wedding. Uh, the the, uh, the the bride's family usually give out a kick certificate, right? Most that's what the, the old way, you know, the the old way is uh, the bride when they, when he when he's uh, when she's getting married, uh, the bride's family will prepare some cake certificate and give out to uh, the bride's family's friends. You take that cake certificate to the designated bakery, and you claim your cakes, right? Whatever that is, that that usually happened. I don't know whether we still do that do that in the Canada. But that was the old way the Chinese people do: give people the cake certificate, so they go to a cake, sh- cake shop, a bakery, and claim the cakes. That is the certificate, or the gift certificate, whatever. God gave Joshua that certificate. Go and claim the land. This is the certificate. My words are the, they are the certificate for you. Go and claim it. You believe it. God gives you and me certificate. The problem is, have you and me gone before, gone, and moved forward to claim the certificate, whatever that is in God's promise in terms of a certificate to Joshua? Can God fail? Absolutely not. I think this is the great encouragement to the Israelite community. And also to Joshua as a leader, because he had to lead the people and to claim that whatever uh, that certificate as well, the land of Canaan. But unfortunately, by uh, 587, 586 BC, of course, you know uh, I had to backtrack a little. Finally, Joshua claimed the land. Okay, on behalf of the uh, Israelite community, they, the, the twelve tribes all got the land. Okay. But then they have kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and later on, because of the rebellion, the kingdom was divided into north and south, north part, northern part called the Israelite, and southern part called the Judah. Unfortunately, the kingdom came to uh, existence by 587, 586 BC because of the grave sin and the rebellion. So the the kingdom of Israel ceased to exist by the 6th century BC because of this sin. But you ask, did God's promise fail? I don't think so. The Bible said it very clearly. If the Israelites, they repent of their sin, if they pray, if they repent, God will bring them back to the land of Israel. And this happened May 14, 1948. After almost how many years? 2,500 years, the kingdom of Israel came into existence again in 1948, after 2,500 years. God's promise never failed. And I want to assure you that God has promises to you and to me today. 
through the Holy Word, we know God has made promises. Whether you are in crisis, I am in crisis, we in difficult situations, God cannot fail. In John chapter 10, verse 27, 29, it says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. If you are an authentic follower of Jesus Christ, your eternal salvation is sure and secure. I don't care whether which, which theological camp you are, but as long as you are a serious follower of Jesus Christ, your salvation is safe and secure. You are safe in the hand of Lord Jesus Christ because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And then in John 16, 33, Jesus again gave us a promise. Said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I think this is the greatest, greatest promise to me. If I want to pick one verse in the Gospel of John, this is the greatest, greatest comfort to me. In this world, I may have trouble, but take heart. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. That's basically what he said is, yes, you and I will come, come across many challenges. Maybe you find our lives in crisis, but it's okay, because God has triumphed. God has overcome. Jesus Christ has overcome. That you and me have a future. We have hope. Doesn't matter how messy the situation is. Doesn't matter how bad it looks like in our own crisis. But Jesus Christ said, don't worry. You may have trouble, but he has overcome the world. That gives me the hope. That gives me the strength to hang on. That makes me, that motivates me to keep walking, not retracting my step and going back. I think life sometimes is interesting. Somehow, some people, they have a smooth life. But most people, they have challenges. They have crises. And these crises come without any warning. I want to assure you, you will have your crisis. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next month. If you get a call from the doctor's office one day, giving you a bad news, don't be surprised. Because in this world, we may have trouble. But the most important thing is, Christ has overcome. And if you are a serious follower of Jesus Christ, stay calm. And Jesus Christ, in, the, in Matthew chapter 28, before he ascended into heaven, he gave this Great commandment. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Somehow we overlook these two verses. We think, oh, this is about the preaching the gospel. Uh, it's about those people who have the gift of preaching the gospel. But this verse... It's also a great assurance and promise to all authentic followers of Jesus Christ. This great commission is not for the leaders. It's for every serious follower of Jesus Christ. This is the biblical mandate for all followers of Jesus Christ. When they say the biblical mandate for the church, that is for you and for me. What is the church? The church is not the building. The church is you and me. And if we are serious following Jesus Christ, we'll take this biblical mandate. And in good times or bad times, we will go and share our lives with those of the unreached. And God and Jesus said, I will be with you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And surely, meaning that it's absolutely certain, I am with you always, present tense. God is with you. Why do we look so dejected? Why do we look so hopeless, even in times of crisis? Finding hope in crisis is what Jesus Christ wants you and me to do it today. I don't know what kind of crisis you are, you are in. I really don't. I can't read your mind. But one thing I, I am absolutely sure is we have hope, even in crisis. 
but the but the question is, we have to be an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We I like to use this term in my paper. I always use term. We have to be missional and incarnational. Missional, take on the mandate of Jesus Christ. Incarnational to live it out, not just with our mouth. Missional, incarnational. They are the characteristics of an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. Because of that, we find hope even in crisis for your own lives and for the church. Let's pray.